Um, talk about why we need AI. Conventionally, we have relied on standardized process and machines to make things more productive. But now, everybody, you, individual, or group of people, companies, require something more special today, or you special. And that requires something more, something for changes and diversified need, rather than just a standardified uniform offering. That's why we need experiment and learn, to learn what is going on in individual you and others. But for the work or responsibility, the business, we need you know, contracts and customers. The opportunity to experiment is limited. That's why we do many, most of the experiments on the computer using a lot of data in the past. That experimental site is the reality of AI. But before that, more important thing is to be flexible with the data. We need to fix, define the outcome, what we try to achieve. So defining outcome and be flexible with the data depending on the conditions. That's what we assume. And uh, this, I'd like to show, visualize this approach by using this demo. I connected my AI to this swinging robot. It allow, uh, we, uh, the, the AI is allowed to change the knee motion to maximize the amplitude of the swing. So, at first, there's no prior knowledge on the swing. The only thing it can do is just randomly, randomly changing its knee motion. But depending on the timing of the knee motion, the amplitude will get a little bit larger or smaller. That is continuously learned to maximize the amplitude. Just after one or two minutes, the amplitude gets a little bit larger than the initial stage, but still, it's, it doesn't seem to be skillful. But this endless pursuit of the outcome and experiment and learning provides skill. Just after three minutes, as you can see, you might feel that you're looking at, as a parent, looking at your child who tried to, you know, swing for the first time. And um, it gets more skillful and skillful, amplitude larger and larger. It demonstrates how this endless experiment and learning provides results. And you see bending knee here and stretching knee here. That's exactly what we do when we ride a swing. But this is not the end of the story. As we wait one more minute, the amplitude gets yet larger. What happened? You know, bending knee here and here twice in a cycle that we do not do. Actually, it is quite reasonable from a mechanical point of view, driving here and there twice in a cycle. But once we get, ha have some skill, we stop experimental and learning. So we are satisfied. You get, you know, status and subordinates, you stop experiment and learning because it is embarrassing. The impact of this experimental learning is more exemplified when we change task. So unplugging the cable from a swinging toy to a horizontal bar toy, it's very different from a mechanical point of view. So it starts again from a very random motion. But this endless pursuit of the outcome experiment learn provides good results, uh, just after three minutes. As you can see, it gets skillful, skillful. Amplitude gets larger and larger. Very different from a swinging motion. Many people ask me, what happens next? So we changed mechanics a, a little bit. The angle of the leg, a little bit larger. Or even this improvement, this experimental learning process makes, utilize this small change. And please look at what happens after this.
Thank you. <laughs> no special software for rotating or no special software for swinging. That's the result of experiment and learning process that we need. And this technology has been used in a variety of workplaces. In warehouse, thousands of orders are handled by hundreds of people. The scheduling, which orders should be placed first, is de decided by that learning process. But the output of the machine is provided to the employees. They do their experiments also. The result is fed to the machine, and that will, AI will give you feedback scheduling. So in this way, people and uh, AI help each other to make robust and su sustainable workplace. And um, on average, 8% of our productivity enhancement is uh, quite uh, cheap. Next example is in finance. I have a friend living neighbor to my house. She has two daughters. Actually, her daughter is a good friend of my daughter's. As her daughters get older, she, has, she needs more money for housing and education. But she has a problem because she is a single mother. Bank avoids risk of a default of a loan by, provide, by you know, making a rule provide loan only for having some, somebody who has a guarantee, or do not provide loan for somebody who is a single mother. Conventionally, it was you know, needed to avoid risk. But now we have lots of data, and this experimental learning process allows more flexible opportunity. That means we can give more opportunity somebody who has not covered by conventional rule. And the accuracy of a you know, prediction of the default is get more accurate and accurate. That means we give more chances to the people who has not covered by conventional rules. And this technology also allows us to save electricity in railway operation by 40% or um, electricity cost of the water plant in 6%. Already six, 57 cases in 40 domains have been utilizing this learning and the experiment learning process. And the key thing is instead of relying on rigid, unchangeable rule, we put defined outcome, but we need to be flexible depending on the context and situations. That's the outcome-oriented approach. More important thing is for this outcome-oriented approach. Providing good outcome for the AI is very essential. If you provide good outcome for the society, it will be a soft, uh, um, fantastic tool for society. But if you provide bad outcome, evil outcome, that will be an evil tool for society. So. Every outcome provided to the AI needs to be related to the happiness of people. We pursued this approach in the last 11 years, starting from measuring, quantifying human behavior by using wearable sensors, like wristband-shaped or bat-shaped. We made this prototype in year 2006. It was actually uh, introduced by the Hubbard Business Review as a historical wearable device. And I became the first test subject. I put the wristband on my rest, wrist list, uh, list March 16th, year 2006. Since then, all my wrist motion has been recorded in a computer. This is year two, 2009, me. Horizontal axis shows 24 hours, January to December. Red shows active motion, blue shows still stop motion. So naturally, sleeping nighttime, so I show this blue belt sign. My life gets a little bit irregular here. I'm move, moving here and uh, sleeping here. This is a uh, travel abode. I was in San Francisco here. This day, 
I'm moving all day long until five o'clock in the morning. Actually, the day, this is the day I moved into my new house. I was overwhelmed by the massive boxes. I moved to work very hard all day. So these are eight years of my life. I can talk about a lot, but the time is limited. This is four people's one year of life. Quite, you know, the patterns are quite different from each person. If you look at person B, the person is waking up at five o'clock in the morning as a laser cut. The person C shows a very flexible life pattern. But if you look at carefully, you can see red, three red belts. Commuting, lunchtime, commuting back to home is more regular than any other people. If you look at person D, you can see a commuting pattern in the morning, but if you look carefully, there is a two straight lines here inside. Maybe I think the person is changing train twice every day. So the data itself is just a wrist motion, but if you combine them and look at the pattern, it shows a much higher meaning. And 11 years ago, we suppose that might include the information of your motivation, productivity, or even your happiness. And since then, we've been measured more than 10,000 people, one million days with millisecond resolution. And we finally succeeded in quantifying your happiness by using sensors. We asked 20 questions for 468 people. How many days did you experience happiness, loneliness, enjoyment, sadness, and so on? So answering from zero to three, happiest people will answer three times 20. That means 60, that's the maximum. This number averaged in your workplace team shows that well, if the team is happy and activated, that number is high or not low. That's the vertical axis. Those people are asked to wear wearable sensor on the chest, motion sensor, accelerometer. And one feature of the chest motion shows a very straight line. The correlation as high as 0.94 shows without any survey data, you can, we can quantify your happiness by the motion. And um, even though you're sitting, you are not stopping you show some slight motion stop, motion stop pattern like this. And we have found happy team shows from start motion and stop motion, that duration is short, long, medium, very diversified. Unhappy people shows very uniform duration from start moving to stop. That's completely unconscious. And by using this, we can quantify your happiness, team happiness. And I believe team happiness is more important because I do not praise the person who would like to be happy at the victim, sacrifice of colleagues. And, uh, and this is very relevant to the business because happy people are more productive. We have lots of data ranging from call center, store, development project. Happy people are consistently more productive and we also found a very tiny interventional thing is relevant to their happiness and productivity. For example, in a call center case, they take some break during work. In a break room, they have some chat among colleagues. Whether such a chatting is placed on that day or not has a tremendous impact on the productivity and happiness of the workplace. So using this ultimate outcome number, happiness, for the experiment learning process driven by AI, we can build the system for you to be happy and more productive. What kind of communication, what, kind, what type of use of time is effective for you to be happy and more productive? We build that, so using this sensor on the chest, and for example, in a call center case, the system provides a supervisor whom you, or a supervisor of a call center, whom you talk to today 
in priority for make them happier and more productive. And actually, there were two call centers doing exactly the same work, same performance. And one of them used this dashboard software for total one year. And on average, the average productivity was different 27%. That's a very big number. We started this service three years ago, and uh, in the last three years, all, uh, over 30 companies have used this um, service and they're expanding very rapidly. And we are convinced that in many variety of conditions, we can universally measure the happiness. But also, the most important thing is the factors that is correlated to happiness is very diversified and depending on the situations, individual or team or context. So we need data and AI to be happier and more productive. We made this application on the smartphone to provide you the advice for you to be happier and your colleagues to be happier and more productive every morning. And uh, 600 sales employees from 27 organizations of our group use that app. And the data sh clearly shows the team who uses that application get happier next month. The team who gets happier shows more sales success rate significantly, 27%. Quite uh, consistent with the call center results. And so we can be happier and more productive by maybe roughly 30%, a very tiny intervention. And also, so far I've talked about special sensor for quantifying your happiness, but your smartphone has an accelerometer. So you put your smartphone on your pocket or wear some, some, somewhere, we can quantify your happiness. So we started this new project of Happiness Planet. It is an Olympic of your happy, happiness Olympic of your workplace globally. Right now, actually today, we are doing um, in Japan, but um, more than 100 teams have joined this event. About uh, 1,100 people have joined to compete each other, enjoy, and to be happy and more productive by using this technology. I make this kind of um, presentation, and many times I was asked that is, does this technology make people uniform, the same, similar? No, this is the very difference from a conventional technology. Once you, know, you use the same software, the function is exactly the same from others. But AI, depending on the data input, the function completely different based on the data. So it is the technology that will diversify you based on where you are or you, what you have strengths. So unlike the conventional machine and process, standardized and uniform, a rigid rule, this technology allows you to release from a rule, be flexible, and uh, deny the rigid rule to deny, to avoid you know, having, providing loan for the single mother. We have lots of opportunity, but to, for this technology, for, for the society, society, peop, uh, happiness of society, we need to put good outcome as a purpose. That is the happiness. And so technology depends on happiness. Happiness depends on technology. In the last 100 years, we have so diversified people aligned with the unified, standardized process and machines. This is the end of that era. Diversified you, people, get blossom at the place where you are placed based on your strength. This new opportunity will allow people to have a blossom based on your strengths and data. Thank you very much.